window opening, economic crisis and a constitutional crisis coming to a head. We're going to be going through some shit. Just look at history and acknowledge that things like this can happen, things like this have happened, things like this are happening right now. The gray state is a part of this Orwellian nightmare that's being set up not only for decades, not only for centuries, if not potentially thousands of years. One world government. New world order. It's real. A lot of people are realizing it and uh, more people are going to have to. Stop the game, the this is an empire in decline. If we don't do something drastic to put the federal government in check, we're going to be doing things the hard way later. We're not scared of them. We're scared of them. The attitude of the government in this case was, we don't care about winning your hearts and minds, we're going to show you who's boss. That is exactly the kind of abuse of power that led to the first American Revolution. Because it's going to get ugly this month and next month, and it's not going to stop. So what is it that keeps it from happening in the United States? I mean, is this the kind of world I want to live in? The only thing that's the government different from any other organization is the government has the ability to compel people to do things via force. And we're seeing it as that, and we're moving past it, we're evolving past it, because we want to create better worlds for our children, every generation does, and we're simply seeing the next way to do that. And in that sense, the libertarian message isn't, you know, statism is bad and government is evil, and you guys are all sheep who need to wake up, it's, hey, Let's improve the information in the market and show you that you're better off without this system of violence. Market actors interacting freely do so voluntarily because they perceive it to be in their own self-interest, that it benefits them. If I buy something from you, it's because I value your product more than my money, and you are going to value that money more than that product. And we both benefit. Anytime you introduce force into that equation in any form, you subtract from humanity's potential to reach that ideal of prosperity and progress. <laughs> public property and public control is what the state control versus what uh, individual control. Uh, economic freedom is, is taken away to some degree because uh, the state controls things like health care. Now the state has to control what you put into your body because you'd obviously be creating a negative externality if you would choose to smoke or drink or whatever. You're, you're now costing the overall public that money. It used to be we had a savings-based economy under an honest monetary system where you couldn't create money and credit out of thin air. If you couldn't afford it, you didn't buy it. This was not poverty, this was responsibility. People look at the old days and they think, before the Federal Reserve, they think, oh, we don't ever return to that, those are the horse and buggy days. These are technological issues. These are not issues regarding the economy. These are things that would have come about by virtue of our dynamic creative spirit that exists on greater and lesser levels in each and every one of us. It's a simple fact of the superiority of using persuasion to get people to do what you want to do as opposed to saying, well, I'm scared and I don't trust you and I'm going to just have someone with government put a gun to your head and do what I want you to do. When people give money to Bill Gates or Sam Walton or any of these people, they, he's not taking it from them. They're getting something in return. They're getting a service, they're getting a product. There is an organization out there that does take the money from and that's the government. You don't have a choice about whether or not you can do business with the government. If you uh, don't want to use our services, that's fine, but you're still going to pay for those services. If you don't pay, we're going to send people with guns to take your money and take your house. Take you. The feudal era, you had a feudal king or lord who would claim half of your crops in exchange for protection. And because the peasants didn't know any better, they could get away with that scam. Give me 20 bucks, or I'll shoot you, or I'll throw you in prison, which is you know, what taxes are. All laws are enforced. 
the facade of statism has to include them throwing us a lot of bone. A farmer will provide health care for his livestock in the same way that a government wants to keep the tax cows healthy and productive. Bribe us with our own money, tax us, and then they take that money and they push it back out. What they hope we don't notice is they take that money from us in the first place. Without the income tax, America historically became the wealthiest country on earth because it goes back to the benefits of a savings-based economy where you're able to accumulate savings and you're not forced to turn it over to a governing authority to redistribute as it sees fit. Understand that your income tax is a farce. The 16th Amendment of the United States was never properly ratified by Congress. People today believe that taxation is absolutely necessary. Like Winston Churchill said, it's the penalty for living in a civil society. This is not true. We lived without an income tax. New Hampshire today still exists without the income tax. And they're thriving. They're doing fine. One reason why the income tax is so detrimental, it's based on the assumption that the government owns everything and they allow us to keep a certain percentage under their conditions. Point that even a 1% income tax is morally wrong because it sows the seeds of destruction. The gray state is a symptom of the step backwards of statism that we're experiencing right now. Two steps forward, one step backwards is, is the course of human progress. And I can look back and say, well, we started the major step backward in 1913 that was the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve legislation was drafted on an island, really called Jekyll Island. All these bankers, the heads of J.P. Morgan, the other large banks at the time got together on this island secretly drafted the legislation and all that stuff. I think that name is perfect, the creature from Jekyll Island. It's this creature that all these different, very well-intentioned people aren't humble enough to recognize that no one can control this power. You give me control over the monetary supply? You think I'm some saint? You gave someone a monopoly, and then they brought that monopoly into D.C. No different than the IMF today, no different than all the corporations and all the guilds, all the unions that are coming to D.C. to seek their monopoly favors. That's what has to be ended for our free enterprise system to find its legs again. Do you people know that America doesn't even own its own money supply? This private central authority is going to loan money to your government at interest so they make money off that debt and then the federal government pays them back plus interest via taxation. You used to try and find a way back in the old days to create gold, which was money and always has been money, out of lead, and they never could figure out a way to do it. The rapture occurred when they realized we can substitute gold with paper money, which we can create infinitely at a very low cost. So this debt is only valid so far as our public is able to cover that debt based upon our level of income taxes. Federal income taxes does one thing, and that's it. When you pay taxes on your income, that goes directly to the Federal Reserve to pay interest on the debt that they create. Anybody not understand that? Anything they cannot pay for via taxation, they turn on the printing presses. At this point, it's analogous to a Mickey Mantle rookie baseball card. You give some governing authority the right to create photocopies of this, pass them off at the same thing, what's going to happen to the existing value of all other Mickey Mantle signed rookie cards in good condition? Well, they used to be rare, so they had value. And now they're increasing the supply. So you have declining demand, and you have greater supply. When you ask for Nancy and crew over there, they say, oh no, inflation is only 102%, don't worry about it. But what if your inflation is 6 or 8%? Somebody's stealing from you. It's, it's theft. What gives our paper its value is its world reserve status. Every currency on earth is backed to some degree or some percentage by U.S. dollars. What used to give that value was that it was backed by something else of value. In our case, we had the highest gold reserves of any country on earth. We had an agreement under Bretton Woods with Saudi Arabia and OPEC, you know, the oil and petroleum exporting nations of the world, that their oil would only be traded exclusively in U.S. dollars. Every other country on earth had to buy U.S. treasuries and convert their currency to U.S. dollars to get oil, which every economy needs to function, of course. That was the key to our prosperity in the early days. It just is what it is. It discourages moral hazard and unnecessary risk. Since the 1970s, we did not have the ability to cover our debts via taxation. It's not popular to raise taxes. You're not going to vote for the politician who does that because that gets old. But we hate it when they stop spending. We like the free goodies. So that's why it is we're in such a deficit crisis and they spend so much money. 
It's, it's popular to spend, it's unpopular to tax. So what do we do? We have the Federal Reserve paper it over. The problem is Congress, the federal bureaucracy, and the military bureaucracies. And remember what runs those things, cash. When you fly into Ronald Reagan National Airport, as you're getting ready to land, if you look towards the Washington Monument, you will see this enormous mountain of cash. The problem with that mountain of cash is it's a magnet for all the wrong people. Everybody in the Beltway exists to get their hands on some of that cash. It essentially creates a situation in which everyone is for sale. I'm going to go back to the Mayor Amschel Rothschild quote, who is the founder of the Bank of England, primary control over nation's currency, I care not who makes its laws. No, they do not directly influence public opinion, the laws, or anything like that. They do so, however, indirectly because they control the money, so they care not who makes the laws because they can use that money, which they can create in perpetuity out of nothing, and give it to their preferred representatives in government and help shape the agenda. People when getting into office can borrow money from the Federal Reserve directly for their political campaigns. They necessarily don't have to pay that money back out of their own savings or their own donations. They just leave that as national debt that the United States owes the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve is happy to create that debt because every dollar created, they get more interest paid back to them. Once they've taken this money from the Federal Reserve, it's like selling your soul to the devil. You don't really have a choice in which bills you pass or which ones you vote no or yes for. Listen, there isn't much altruism when you're flooded with cash. <laughs> How long have they been trying to do this? Forever. Forever. Bankers are like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you let them do it. What you need is gutsy presidents, gutsy Congress people to prevent it. As humans, we're designed to worry about the next tribe coming over and attacking our clan. And men are designed to look out towards the horizon and see threats. But we only see military threats or criminal threats or thugs. We have not been designed to see corporate threats where global corporations get their people into government, then the traitors in government sign government authority over to that. That's how this incremental treason to the North American Union, the European Union, now becoming more and more dictatorial, has been set up. You have to ultimately, in a free market, assume the risks and responsibilities associated with the freedom again to succeed and the freedom to fail. We don't have that. So the Federal Reserve is going to create Mickey Mantle baseball cards ad nauseum and infinitum. They're going to just print them out to cover all these bad debts that went wrong when Goldman Sachs, Federal Reserve shareholder, decided to sell a whole bunch of these uh, securitized mortgages thanks to the repeal of Glass-Steagall to foreign investors all over the world that went bad and they knew would go bad. The fraud element comes in, they knew they were going to go bad. So the Federal Reserve creates moral hazard again for these large banks by saying, don't worry, we'll paper it over. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding with decisive action. Over 700 points. Apple shares are just getting hammered. We're down by between 3 and 4.5 percent. A national rescue plan. $85 billion deal. And supply urgently needed money so banks and other financial institutions can avoid collapse and resume lending. Not passing a bill now would cost these Americans much more later. And every time they manufacture a depression in the marketplace, they receive a bailout. Smaller competitors do not, so they can buy up the assets, again, the things of tangible, actual value from the productive people in the economy, and they're confiscating it on pennies in the dollar, because when you're liquidating in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy situation, you're gonna take whatever you can get. Then Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America can swoop in, take control of all those assets. They didn't produce anything. They didn't make anyone's life better, but uh, they're rolling in the dough, aren't they? The primary problems here is that there's an absolute unification of money and power and government. And you need to try, for the sake yeah. of uh, sanity and liberty, to try and prise those things apart, because at the moment, they are one. In the Roman period, they used to talk about bread and circuses as entertainment for quote-unquote the mob. It's, it's not quite that obvious, but the truth is they, everybody gets to drive a better car, everybody gets to live in a nicer home, and what we really want people to do is go to the mall and shop and be entertained. They've been very successful in turning the body of the American population into sedated consumers. Well, you can only sedate the consumer so long. When the consumer runs out of his ability to consume, when he suddenly wakes up and recognizes that what he thought he had, he doesn't, the money he thought he had is gone, the wealth he was promised is, is vanished, 
That's when the game is up. Today, inside Washington, the mainstream mentality is that you and I and the rest of us that are talking in these terms are out of touch with reality. Our banking system is a safe and a sound one. Our deficit problems are completely manageable. Everything will be fine. We'll pass some reforms, some new legislation. We'll make it all right. Part of the scam of government by printing money, by borrowing money, we don't have to tax people directly. We can commit intergenerational child abuse and pass that bill off to the people who, when born into America, have a $45,000 stone around their neck as their share of just the federal debt in its most conservatively estimated forms. People keep throwing around these numbers that were 15 trillion in debt, 16, 17. Those are all old numbers. It came out in Bloomberg Financial and other news outlets that under Obama's administration in the first two years, over 23.7 trillion is missing. And that's on top of all the missing trillion from Bush. Raising the debt ceiling, which has done, been done over 100 times, does not increase our debt. We have now seen our national debt go to the tune of $211 trillion. If you consider all the government guarantees to workers for their retirements, and their pensions, etc. We're at a point now where if you were to tax the American public to the tune of 100% of their income for the next 20 years, you wouldn't put a dent in the interest. And we see the economy falling apart. And before people said, you know, I can't really believe that this is all by design. How do just tens of trillions of dollars go missing? And then Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman, just laughs at congressmen and senators when they ask him, hey, where's the missing trillions? When everybody's struggling in this economy, Ben Bernanke's out celebrating at this huge gala event. And meanwhile, there's children starving. What'd you do at the 2008 Bilderberg meeting? I'm not doing any press today. For people in high office and high places, there is no accountability. And they like that. And it's a wonderful situation to be in. Never having to answer for, for what you've done. Will you tell the American people to whom you lent 2.2 trillion of their dollars? Scam tell us who they are. No. We are in debt, our kids are in debt, our grandchildren are in debt. It is time to stop. And if I recall, back in 2009, I think it was, they said that people with incomes are a threat to their agenda. It seems to me that they want to make sure that the people don't have any money to fight back. The thing that, that my baseball coach as a child taught me the most is that in life you are going to lose. Okay. I have a side if winners, mm -hmm. then who's going to pick up the trash? Yeah. Who's going to flip the burgers? Who, you know, there's but, not that many college students in the world, right? When I work every day for family and generations after me, I just don't know what their lives are going to be like. You know, that's my biggest fear, is what are we all going to pay for 50 years from now? Our deficits are to such a degree that when you cannot cover it via taxation, no one's willing to loan you money anymore. And that's what we've been doing. We've been borrowing our way to financial prosperity from foreign central banks and they won't lend to us anymore because they know mathematically we cannot pay it back via taxation. Bottom line, that's what this is about. They're just creating money, they're devaluing it, and there's no alternative. The, the direction we're going in right now is debt and dependency. You understand the principles of the debt super cycle, and eventually that super cycle comes to an end. The U.S. Treasury bond is the largest bubble out there, bigger than the credit card and the education bubble. It's several times bigger, and they're going to discover this unfortunate fact very painfully. And what happens then in times of economic crises is you go back to the world reserve currency, you buy up U.S. Treasury bills because it's a store of value. They can dump that on our market at any time. Create overnight hyperinflation. It means all commerce shuts down. America and its best friend in the Gulf may be in for a difficult breakup. The Saudi prince Bandar bin Sultan said there will be, quote, a major shift away from the U.S. Well, if you know that in six months your dollars are going to lose 20% of the value, you're not going to save them, which is what we depend upon. You're sure as hell not going to back your currency by them. You're going to buy shit up while the buying's good. You see it now? you got China out buying up infrastructure all over the United States, Russia doing the same thing. So they're taking these worthless U.S. dollars and they're buying up this country. And then there'll be a flight to safety in commodities, gold, silver, etc., to save what you have left. So essentially, at some point, 
all of the world's banks are going to dump dollars and those dollars are going to start chasing goods and services and as the means of production becomes more and more handicapped by government intervention more and more regulation less people are going to invest the whole thing falls apart the news you see this is happening right now the smartest minds in the world are saying these bonds are cooked we've had it the rally is over the long awaited bond apocalypse is happening so what is real wealth is it in a paper currency again no that's just paper it's kindling it's something to write on it's something to wipe your backside with what does that paper get you goods and services what does a bank confiscate did they come after your paper no they come after your house they come after your cars they come after the actual goods and services that had the value to begin with. And that's why everyone who's inside the Beltway is so desperate to convince everyone it won't happen. Because there is no way to avoid it anymore. The economy is going to be okay. Keep them working because you don't want to create pandemonium. You start getting people too scared about what's going on and start fearing the government, then they're going to have a revolution. They can't have that. They want to keep it on the tipping point where they have control. They're going to use our own money to enslave us and collapse the monetary system at the same time, because again, every currency on Earth is backed by US dollars. If there's nothing to replace it, you only have chaos. In June of 1929, Mr. Mellon, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, told the American people that they lived in an era of unbroken prosperity, that they had nothing to fear. At the same time, he was liquidating all of his investments in the market. He was putting everything into cash and gold. He wasn't alone. Mr. Geithner recently made the statement that our banks are solvent, that there is no issue. We have nothing to be concerned about. Nothing could be further from the truth. about conditioning the kids is the idea of creating a new generation that thinks differently than the previous generation. Teaching the kids that they should think a certain way or they should feel a certain way or they should vote a certain way. of psychology, the study of psychology, how people think and how people can specifically be manipulated. If you're familiar with the psychology of B.F. Skinner, what he would have you believe is that human beings are not creatures of introspection. They're not creatures of internal cognition. They have no soul, thought processes, they have no free will. What they are are animals to be trained. So you have Skinner's operant conditioning chamber or the Skinner box where he trained based on a system of punishment and reward. Essentially what it does is it bypasses braining function and goes straight to an animal training method. You create a problem, offer a solution that drives them toward a pre-designed response. This is called the Hegelian dialectic. The Hegelian dialectic is a formula and a strategy for creating a problem to then offer a solution that you have to the very problem that you've created to get the outcome that you desire that you wouldn't have been able to get if you didn't create the problem in the first place. Now the Hegelian social theory was adopted by Lenin, by Marx, and it was applied politically in the form of communism. The German psychologist Wilhelm Wundt, he is the first one to apply it to education. The American education system is a combination of Hegelian social theory and experimental psychology. And that's the whole idea behind working with the kids. It's this concept of in local parentheses that the school is the parents when the parents are not there. Most people are too busy working the 9 to 5, and now that 9 to 5 is turning into 9 to 9 to be able to just survive, tripling the amount of time we have to transfer knowledge and information to our children who are young. So by making sure both parents are away from the children, at work, they can guarantee that the social environment of school, preschool, daycare is going to be able to give the children the knowledge that they want to. So what you have is the degradation of the individual, you have the promotion of the state, and you have the elimination of the middle class. Now under this operant conditioning from Skinner, the only thing you learn is how not to get punished and how to achieve your reward. You're not going to come away from this system thinking, I'm going to stand up for something because it's right. You're going to do it because there's either reward or consequence involved being trained to enter the workforce as a valueless cog in the state. Oh, 
Won't somebody please think of the children? I'm a product of the public school system. Nobody ever taught me anything. I mean, I think we read the Declaration of Independence in the fifth grade, possibly. But I think the, the, the school systems are designed to keep people uninformed and to not understand the scope of their rights and where they come from. I think the powers that be would, would ultimately love everyone to believe that their rights come from the state. Developing them to not question authority. We're developing them to be entitled, that the government will take care of them from cradle to grave. These efforts have been pretty successful. We have whole generations of kids that are being raised to not think like free people, to think like slaves, to think like they don't have self-determination. To be able to control the masses, you have to get rid of that. Because if you don't, you can't control those people. The old saying, divide and conquer, it's easier to manage a population when you have two primary belief systems. You're either A or you're B. These people are conditioned to think a certain way and support a certain team. You know, they pick their winning team, whether it's Democrat or Republican, and then that's their guy. And it doesn't matter what that person votes for. As long as their guy wins, things are going to be different. It's all theater. It's just political theater. We go from rule based on constitutional law to rule based on a cult of personality. Well, he might be wrong, but he's my president, so I'm going to stand with him. That's a very dangerous mode of thinking. Do you support freedom and the American Constitution, or do you support this person? We've all seen where that led in Cambodia and Russia and Germany. Beach Bush and Cheney, everybody's got to obey the laws. Vote for Democrats. Obama, yeah. Woo! The path to hell is paved with good intentions. Right. Thank you. Your Obama's just as bad as the rest of them. Why you say that? I'll make our government open and transparent. I intend to close Guantanamo and I will follow through on that. We will bring an end to this war. I will be held accountable. These are bills that Congress ran up. Cut the deficit we inherited by half. You will not see your taxes increase one single time. If I don't have this done in three years, then there's going to be a one-term proposition. The Obamanoids, you're going to have 20 to 25 percent of the American public who will always support Obama no matter what he does because their own ego is on the line and they won't admit it. Those are not facts. All of real life President Obama! Yeah. What's your favorite thing about President Obama? List a million different reasons. I think it's truthful. So he's for public education. Yes, everybody in Cleveland, no minority, got Obama phone. Keep okay. Obama in okay. president, okay. Yeah. you know. His public speaking yeah. skills are yeah. mad. Uh, 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 I'm smart. He's funny. You sign up, you're a full step to Social Security. You got low income, you disability. He just knows what to do. Rami, he sucks. Don't be Give me, a, give me three. Three main reasons. And the American people have been complacent over the last several decades. They've enjoyed unparalleled prosperity. And let's face it, the average American on the street, he, he's not interested in what's happening in Kuwait. He could care less about Libya or something else. And so if you tell him, well, listen, we're bombing for democracy, goodness, freedom, human rights, so he said, okay, it doesn't affect him. He doesn't have to go. His children don't have to go. There doesn't appear to be any risk to him. Now that's changing. He's done everything Bush did, but more. Oh, I don't agree with that. He had to continue what was started. You can't just say, okay, we're done. Well, sure, he didn't end the wars, but there are wars now, so we're in support of it. And, oh, well, sure, he hasn't completely pulled out of Iraq, but at least he's reducing the number of troops there. Oh, so it's, it's diet tyranny. It's tyranny light now. There's a lot of other reasons why I'm going to vote for Obama, and hearing that stuff honestly doesn't change it. I agree to good. Most of the policies he's put in place, I agree with him. And he's challenging the status quo. Well, he is the status quo. <laughs> Obama's going to take us forward. I pledge to be a servant to our president and all mankind. Because, because together, together we can, together we are, and together we will be the change that we seek. I know people who have destroyed relationships with their families when they realize that their neocon uncle and their liberal 
cousin weren't just well-intentioned, that they were creating a justification for coercive government and ideology, that they were externalizing their own desires to control others, and that that was reflected in those relationships. But if that's the case, those weren't healthy relationships to begin with. I want I'm nonviolence. Gonna... Yes, I want so do I. Non-violence. No, you don't. You're an Obama supporter. Does do you think he wants mean? to go kill people with drone strikes? Well, then that's why what he wants to do? He orders it done, so I would assume All right, so. you're out of your mind. After a certain point, there's no more deniability. They can't say, oh, I didn't know or, or I didn't understand. As humans, each of us have a worldview, and that worldview is usually formed in great part by the culture we grow up in. When we hear information that contradicts our worldview, social psychologists call the resulting insecurity cognitive dissonance. When your beliefs are challenged, fear and anxiety are created. Denial, which is probably the most primitive psychological defense, is the one most likely to kick in. Accept propaganda from their government that if it came from the Soviet Union, they would have laughed at it. But it comes from the Pentagon, and they get down and worship. They, they go around looking for ways to defend the problem. You can find people all over that will say that we should end the war, but they have a lot of trouble saying that when they meet a soldier. The bravado of the current U.S. military forces, it's definitely about psychological conditioning. It's the idea that when life and death is on the line, you cannot afford to believe anything but the fact that you are the biggest, baddest force on the face of the earth. It's like they say, you know, yeah, I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil because I'm the meanest motherfucker in the valley. It's like a big video game that I can watch on my TV. And it's like you see all the flags all Patriotism means that you support everything the government wants. A true patriot defends liberty and the people. What a day, man. What a day. So we condition them and we convince them that their cause is just and that their enemy is subhuman and not worthy of living. And the American people honestly play a role in that. brave soldiers that have come from a combat zone defending our freedoms. Let's give them a round of applause. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't buy into that, really? I'm given tax breaks for being a veteran. I'm given discounts on my car insurance. I can go to the commissary, you know, tax-free groceries. I get all the benefits I could ever want in the military. Why would I question that? Honestly, as a vet, it's gotten to the point now where it's so insincere um, when you meet people and they say, oh, thank you for your service. It's like, you know, what do you know about my service? What do you know about what I've gone through and what I've been through? They don't realize the bigger pieces of the grand chessboard as at play. And right now you guys are in a shooting war with people who are supposedly such a threat to our liberties. We have to demonize liberty in this country now because it could result in a nuclear, biological, or chemical attack by a bunch of people who don't even have an air force. They don't have political cohesiveness in these regions of the world. They don't have cultural cohesiveness. You've got all these different Muslim sects that hate each other and can't get along, we're supposed to believe that if we're too free in this country, we all be exposed to an attack from these elements.
When we went into Afghanistan in 2001, we had one real tangible concrete objective, and that was to find and either capture or destroy Osama bin Laden and his supporting crew. We missed the boat. We failed. But if you trace back how this happened, this certainly had nothing to do with the special forces on the ground. It had everything to do with decisions made at a higher level. And again, when you go into Iraq in 2003, we, we take a, a, an operation that should have been over in a week, and we drag this out for two and a half weeks. We arrive in Baghdad, and no one knows what to do. No action was taken. The general simply said, well, we, we haven't been given orders. Son of a bitch. You're talking about a group of people that have risen to very high levels by deliberately doing nothing. Because if you do nothing, you make no mistakes. And in most cases, the American soldier, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, marine, sailor, air, it doesn't matter, he'll figure it out and get it right. Well, the problem is that we ran into a set of circumstances where that didn't work. They couldn't make it right. They couldn't muddle through. They couldn't just shift the burden of decision-making to the lowest level and hope for the best. And so ultimately, you end up with the opposite outcome, where everyone is micromanaged, everyone is tightly controlled, while the people at the top try to figure out what it is that they're supposed to do and how to do it. And this drags on for many, many years. And then finally, in 2007, with this so-called surge, the civil war is effectively over, the Shiites have already won, and somebody decides, well, we need to go in and do something to create the illusion that we've won something. We can't just leave. So we sacrifice a thousand good American soldiers, killing large numbers of Sunni Muslim Arabs and a few Shiites, and then anybody we can, we buy off with hundreds of millions of dollars in cash. This was a strategic catastrophe from the vantage point of our friends and allies in the Middle East. And now it's irreversible. So we uh, pump these soldiers full of experimental vaccines. We send them out with, you know, the equipment made by the lowest bidder into these combat zones. We have soldiers who are coming home. They look at all this and they say, well, it seems like that was wrong, but how could I admit that that was wrong? Because I was a part of it. I mean, if, if the American public can't tell you this, if we have to serve, you always come across that mentality too. Oh, you didn't serve, you don't know. I was over in the Persian Gulf getting ready to liberate Kuwait, which is a kingdom, a dictatorship, and here I am liberating their oil assets from Iraq. I thought I was doing the right thing too. And it's really hard to look back on that and say, hey, you know, that military conflict that I was in, that my friends died in, that I got shot at in, I have nightmares about, I guess that really should have never happened. And unfortunately, the media has worked tirelessly to ensure that this truth doesn't reach the American people. You all remember those clips in the old days, the black and white, and you'd see the news guys, they'd always go up and they'd be in people's face with the big flash bulbs, you know, Senator, Senator, this happened, this happened. You'd always hear, you know, politicians being held accountable and they're always being asked questions and you don't see that anymore. Leaders have found a way to call the masses into their own ideal sets. And whether that's through bread and circus, such as the Roman Empire, or today through the mainstream media, they get to decide that, yes, you're going to be obsessed with American Idol for over a decade, and when that starts to wane, you know what, we'll come up with Dancing with the Stars, and let's really be concerned about who wins the Super Bowl. Three keys to power are banking, the media, and politics. If you own the banks, you can buy the media, you can buy the politicians. If you own the media, you can control what people see, what people think, you can largely shape the culture, you can create and shape people's fears, people's desires, the perceptions that they have of events. In high definition. Get out of here. Watch me, watch me, watch me. Watch me. In 1975, there was a Senate investigation committee called the Church Hearings, which actually uncovered that the CIA was paying under the table mainstream media outlets, $250 million a year to act as gatekeepers and propagandists. In today's terms, that's a billion dollars a year. Of course, they say they don't do that anymore, but it's foolish to think that they don't. Why do you think the top story is the top story on all major networks? Carl Cameron, 
I will tell you straight up, I can't answer anything unless it comes from my editors. I can't unless I've got it approved from media relations. I, gotta, I can only talk in front of my own camera. I'm sorry. Will you talk about Building 7? Talk about Building 7, help educate the public. If you get video of Sarah Palin or get a soundbite from her, bring that back to us. You can hold the Ron Paul stuff. <laughs> we single out something that the media likes to talk about, such as the Trayvon Martin Trayvon issue, Martin but we don't talk about the much more serious events that are already well underway. You can't say that this isn't interesting. You can't say that this isn't newsworthy. Obviously, there is a blackout in effect. The mainstream media, though, wants to stay in business. And if they suddenly discover that the people listening to them don't want that message, they'll change their tune. A lot of them are doing solid investigative journalism. Watergate, people were held accountable. People were fired. People were demoted. People were dealt with. There were, there were prison sentences handed out. At least there was the illusion of some kind of accountability back then. There are, there are operations. This one has become, has gotten a great deal of publicity. Yeah, they're dead Americans as a result of this failed and reckless program. The American citizenry now, like you've said, Fast and the Furious, it's, they've done a great job. We just don't give a shit. First of all, I think that they shouldn't give us too much information because anything that you and I can watch on television, our enemies can watch, it's better to not say too much. The mainstream media can actually do its job and it doesn't matter. The American public is now in a state of apathy, almost a state of numbness. Like, I think going back to, again, the feelings of powerlessness, the idea that the powers that be are in control, they're the experts, let them handle it. 45 states across the country have adopted new standards known as Common Core. Got Charles in the desk right next to the textbook. Run tests and then test what less look. Look at this, these heads in the mess, but I got this diploma. And I don't want to go to the jail either. It's illegal for me to be the teacher. Less sanctioned by the state agenda. K through 12, where the fuck do we end up? Here is, is there federal dollars tied to it or even federal waivers putting pressure on local school boards to have to teach a certain way or a certain curriculum? We condition the kids. What do we condition the kids to do? We always tell them always share, always work in teams, and that's a good lesson on some level. But what we don't teach the kids is that it's okay to work hard and earn and, and benefit from that. The prevailing attitude in America today is almost that you should be ashamed to be successful. You should be ashamed to be rich. And that if you are rich, the assumption is that you got rich by taking from somebody else. What's your name? Michael. Mike, you here with this uh, Occupy movement? Yeah. yeah. What do you think about it? I think it's great, man. What do you, what do you think is great about it? Um, everything. What are they doing? They're chilling. process of forming the reasons why you are here. Exactly correct. Why are you here? My interpretation is uh, a lot of people have had some hard bumps in life that want things to be free, more entitlements. We have to ask a couple of basic questions. The first basic question, what should the role of government be? Should the role of government be there to run the entitlement system? Should we believe this, this story that entitlements are rights? Do people have a right to medical care? Do they have a right to a food, a right to a house? And I said, no, they don't. They have a right to their life, they have a right to their liberty, if they had a right to keep their property, then they would be able to afford it. When government does it, they end up not getting anything. The lie that, that's at the, at the core of collectivism is that this is all for the collective. It is all for the good of the collective. Once they get you to swallow that lie, any other lie they tell in service of that, is not a lie. And a lot of the people out there in activism are embracing big government. They think that big government should be used for our benefit, that they can use it for our benefit. And the argument being, again, that you can't. That kind of control of central power, that's it's too much control for any one group. I'm a warrior for the middle class. I, I do think at a certain point you've made enough money. They're saying that if you have more personal wealth than we think is necessary, and we're going to give it to people that don't have any personal wealth, have the moral high ground and say that we are going to take care of the poor, what do they do? 
welfareism and inflationism and socialism, they produce the poor. It's not in the best interest of the people that run welfare programs to get people off welfare. Their funding is based on the number of clients that they have. Well, if they get a client off welfare, they get a client a job, then they lose that client, they lose that client's money. Because you've got to remember, it's a skimming game. For every dollar that goes to a person on welfare, $10 is used to support that system. All these entitlement programs, they'll go on forever if you let them, because they will encourage people to become entitled. Well, I can work for minimum wage, or I can just quit my job and go on welfare if I have kids. Welfare is a better deal, because I still get the money and I don't have to work. We have cultivated this large underclass that has made itself dependent upon government, and government has encouraged that. The ruling elite love to create a nanny state because then you'll go along with their plan. You're not going to bite the hand that feeds you. We have historically been a bottom-up society. We're not a top-down society. You can't make someone equal economically to someone else by giving them something. Are you going to hear Mr. Obama talk in those terms? No, Mr. Obama says everyone gets everything for nothing in perpetuity. Don't worry, we'll print money. You can all be permanently dependent upon us, and that's a good thing. Honestly, it's, it's almost like slavery. If you don't have the means to